be relevant, it needs to be accountable, and it needs to be participatory. Unless it fulfills these, it's either unethical or and really not justifiable. So the problem now has been that while we were sleeping over the past couple of decades, this sacred profession has become an industry. And not many people give us the same kind of sanctity that was accorded to our forefathers when they started on this noble profession. So what we have now is research and society existing in a very, very uneasy tension with the only thing trying to keep it together being the ethical oversight that supposedly exists. Well, what we actually need is a responsive society, responsible researchers with ethics and science integral to the endeavor. So if you want to look at what we do, science, we are trying to expand or extend the frontiers of biomedical research. Whereas ethics and ethic governance says, should we be doing this? And if so, how should we do this? The problem often is the two don't often mix. In actual fact, science and ethics are inseparable in research because research that does not follow ethical norms, you will agree, is inexcusable. But ethical research, which has no chance of yielding valid results, is unethical because it can harm. It can provide wrong evaluations, ineffective treatments, deny effective treatments, and betray the trust of research, researchers and users of healthcare. So it's no surprise that all speakers have alluded to the fact that you really cannot trust most of the research evidence you find today. And that's primarily because the agenda itself has been hijacked by the industry and by academia. We have very entrenched ways of looking at it. So DSM 3, 4, 5, we rearrange the furniture without even thinking of anything new that can actually provide a, an avenue for research because we keep doing it ourselves. And there are many ways in which uh, unnecessary, inappropriate, poorly designed and reported results result doesn't give you the same outcomes when you try it out in clinical practice. And so many randomized controlled trials reported very well are just designed to deceive people who do not know how they are being deceived. And uh, we just don't understand how statistics get manipulated in order to give us a rosy picture. And uh, there are a lot of undisclosed conflicts of interest that basically this whole endeavor needs to be looked at very carefully. And to compound this, we also have crime. We have fraud, genuine, absolute fraud. And Ajay got me involved in his editorial, in his uh, uh, magazine, which is a very good journal, like really like the depth and scope of what it does. But what I would like to actually mention is that while the big cases of fraud make headline news, what does not make headline news is a daily misrepresentation of research that occurs all over the world, and particularly in our educational institutions. So redefining misconduct is occurring on a continuum from ignorant and irresponsible research to deliberate acts is the first thing that we have to do. So it's not just falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism that we have to worry about, but what is called questionable research practices, ways in which you fiddle around with things, don't do things the right way. The problem is both have the same effect. We've been given a lot of advice on how we should conduct and report trials, and there are various variations of it. There are many people who don't read this. And CONSORT 2010 has also been published. And if you go to the Equator Network website, you will find similar reporting guidelines for every other branch of research, observational studies, qualitative research, surveys, everything. Incorporating the science and transparency required for us to trust what research we do. Although they don't talk about ethics, the URM, you know, Uniforms Requirements for Manuscripts, talks about how we should be doing this. So one would expect that published research conforms to all of this. And one would expect that journal editors require authors to submit their manuscripts according to this. Unfortunately, 65 Indian medical journal editors don't really believe this. And the trials published in our Indian medical journal, 65 of them, really don't give you the amount of information that can tell you you can trust those results. This is published and circulated to all these journal editors, and we repeated the survey two years later, and we find that still not many of the journal editors believe it is their duty to require manuscripts to be submitted according to concert, 
and the trials themselves very rarely report important aspects of design that will help you to trust those results. Not much difference. Some things change, a lot of it doesn't change, some gets worse. So the problem now is, what's really enduring is to see that the amount of number of trials where they report that ethics committee approval was got, has gone up. It's interesting that ethics committees are approving trials which have no validity. Who's responsible for all this? Well, you can say it's me, but I'm bringing other people into it. It's actually the unrealistic expectations of society. You want to live longer, you want to be slimmer, richer, wealthier, fly to the moon, do all kinds of things. I think that's nice to know this, but there are limits to what we actually can do with the current knowledge that we have. And therefore, it brings an unrealistic response from the biomedical fraternity who try to do this. Keep people on respirators for long, beyond any reason to be alive. And of course, there is the god of all things, technology, market forces, conflicts of interests, and wherever there's inequity, there will be exploitation. There are a lot of ambitions that individuals and institutions have, and a lot of irresponsible behavior of researchers and the gatekeepers, and the funders, and the people who govern and participate in research. Let me give you an example of something we, we take for granted. We believe that going and having general medical health checkups will help all of us. And we have this huge thriving industry where we have master health checks ranging from a few tests to PET scans. Now, the Cochrane collaboration checked this out and said, why do we do these health checks? It's because we want to detect disease and the risk factors for disease and treat them so that we can reduce morbidity and mortality, particularly due to cancer and cardiovascular disease. Wouldn't you agree? But nobody is really evaluated to see, do they actually do that? And there could be burdens. You could increase the number of diagnoses you do and increase worry and increase costs. So let's see what happens when you look to see, can we get all the research on this topic? Now this is a summary of findings from this review, which identified something like 14 trials across the world, done mainly in Europe and US, in affluent countries. If you look at the mortality associated with or without health checkups for a median of nine years follow-up, ranging from four years to four